So I will jump right in through this agenda, starting with case trends in the US. Um, and again, for those who are new to this sort of update, I just try to give you my overview on how I see the state of the pandemic in, the, in this case, four months since we last had this conversation. And what I see is cases actually sort of uniquely staying kind of high, but stably so over the last four or five months in a way that it hasn't really done in the pandemic before. Um, if you just compare raw numbers, we're actually slightly better off than we were at this time last year, just starting to come down from Delta. On the other hand, we're testing, I think, a lot less, capturing fewer cases. So this true number may be a bit higher. Um, so there's still a lot of virus around, and there has been for most of the year. Despite that, hospitalizations are considerably lower than they were at this stage last year. Deaths are even lower still. Um, and I think this has come at a cost. I think this is because of the accrued population immunity, a lot of it through vaccination, but an unfortunate amount of it through infection and a lot of, of harms. And despite the improvements, we're still at a pretty high level of death considering respiratory viruses. This would have been strikingly alarming three years ago. Um, this, you know, the, the sort of the best we've been in the past year was a pace for 110,000 deaths a year. This is a really bad flu year. And again, this is if we extrapolate the single best day of a seven-day moving average to a full year. We've already gone up by another you know, 30% since then. And, um, and I, as I'll get to, I think we're going to get a little bit worse through the winter. So I think there's a lot of reasons to think we can still improve upon where we are. But we've come a long way, and I think we should appreciate that as well. Um, I won't spend much time in the Massachusetts uh, dashboard. I try to have sources for everything I put. So if you want to go back through the slides, it's, this is, I think, a really rich dashboard that you can go through. It's now updated weekly. The only, uh, but I think we're basically in, this, in a similar position in Massachusetts as the country as a whole. And so I won't belabor this. The one thing that we do in Massachusetts differently than elsewhere is we sort of fractionate hospitalizations. Um, we, we have ways to track, the state has ways to track whether the primary reason for admission is COVID or not. And this fraction has steadily fallen. So although this number is pretty high, the number who are admitted because of a COVID diagnosis, according to the admitting physicians, is about a third of where it looks, which is good. Again, a sign of progress. Um, I'll spend a bit, um, a moment on wastewater levels, um, just because as we are testing less and less, um, I've gone over data in the past. There's some publications showing that these wastewater levels of virus are a fairly reliable predictor of case trends, um, and they should be unaffected by testing behavior. Um, and so this actually tells a fairly similar picture. Um, we've been in this long, steady plateau for a long time. If you look at these data, they are a little bit higher than we were in the post-Delta period, which I think is probably accurate and fits with less testing. Um, but we're still way down from where we were, sorry, um, way down from where we were at the peak of Omicron, um, but still quite a bit higher than we were in its immediate aftermath. Um, a few seconds to reflect on longer term case trends, and I don't want to go through all of this in detail, and I don't at all want to imply that we could have predicted much of this, but I think if you look back, we can explain most of the undulations on this epidemic curve by variants, at least all the ones since 2021 has started. And the first couple were mostly kind of behavioral and a novel virus. So we had alpha, a more transmissible virus, that was kind of battling against the rollout of vaccines, but still caused the blip. Delta, even more transmissible, still caused a large spike. Omicron, we all know about from immune evasion. And then this, I think, this plateau hides a, a sequence of, of sort of rapidly successive takeovers of sub, of sub lineages of Omicron. And so I think almost all of these surges we can explain, except winter 2020. And the start of winter 2021, and so I've actually now just overlaid what I call coronavirus season, because for human coronaviruses, before SARS-CoV-2 came around, you know, this was about the, November to February is about when all the other common cold causing human coronaviruses peak. And for whatever alch alchemical reasons, it's people gather around here, we have holidays, there's a lot more people indoors or, and or some environmental factors that affect virus stability. This is kind of when coronaviruses do their thing in our society. And so I think that's actually the best explanation for this winter surge. And if you'll notice, there's actually a striking uptick before Omicron took over. I will say this is kind of my, and not just my hunch, a lot of people think this, but a lot of people don't. And you know, clearly it's not the only thing that predicts viral behavior, but I say this to say, I think things are gonna get worse this winter, even if we don't see a new um, variant. And I hope I'm wrong about that. That's kind of my expectation going into the winter. So briefly, variants. Um, we are in the Omicron show. This whole year has been sublineages of Omicron. Right now, it's mostly dominated in the US and around the world by BA5. It's causing 90% of cases. That's been true for quite a while. There's a new sublineage of BA4 called BA4.6 that's kind of making a little bit of a stir. It's increasing in frequency, although mostly it's pushing out the non-BA5 variants. We'll see where that goes. Um, I don't want to belabor this, but I'm just showing at the top the pre-Omicron variants, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, which we were, especially Beta and Delta, worried about their immune evasion. But in retrospect, once Omicron came along, 
it's antigenically way more distinct. This is the spike protein. Every dark spot you see is a mutation. It was just a complete transformation when we got to Omicron. And the next thing I wanted to show is that actually the, the most recent set of lineages, the BA2 and the subsequent ones, BA2, 212, 1, 4, and 5, are pretty different, again, from BA1. They're at least as far from BA1 mutationally as the original variants that we worried about before Omicron got here. So we are seeing some real variability. It's causing real immune changes. I'm not showing the underlying data for the interest of time, but I think that's the reason we're seeing one lineage take over after another, is that Omicron's able to sort of immunologically riff in a way that allows one strain to supplant the next. But we haven't seen anything like Omicron again. That's not to say we won't, but globally, I don't see anything like this yet, looking around. Um, you know, from the time we saw Omicron to the time it took over was only a month. So this doesn't give us that much comfort, but it's better than having seen it. Um, and I, I'm not at all ready to say that there's nothing more like this on the horizon. I think only time will tell. But sort of, I think it's going to depend on how many tricks the spike protein and the ACE2 interface have for us. And that is an unanswered question in my mind. Okay, quickly vaccines, the latest look at efficacy. Um, while they have been less effective in the Omicron era uh, because of a divergence between the vaccine and the Omicron spike, we'll come back to that very shortly, um, it, it, they've been less effective at preventing transmission. They're still really, really good at stopping severe disease and death. These are the latest data from the CDC that are compiled in an age-adjusted way. The most recent data they have as of yesterday was from June. Um, and that showed that still, in only the exclusive to the month of June, there was an eightfold reduced risk of death among those who had been boosted compared to those unvaccinated, and a fivefold reduced risk of death in those who had uh, undergone the primary series. This is at all ages aggregated together. Um, and still, the single best graphic I've seen for the efficacy of vaccines against severe illness is New Zealand, uh, is, is a comparison of New Zealand, a highly vaccinated country, to Hong Kong, where uh, for sociological reasons, unfortunately, that their elderly were really uh, under-vaccinated. Both got a lot of cases from BA2. There was very, very little death in New Zealand and a tremendous amount um, in Hong Kong. Like this was New York City in March 2020 level devastation. So this, I think, just really underscores how amazing these vaccines are still at preventing severe disease, even as they get more and more divergent from, uh, from Omicron. So the real story for today, I think, is, a, is about variant boost. Because for the first time since 2021, you can go to the pharmacy and get a vaccine that matches the strain that's circulating around us. Uh, why did this take so long? Why has it been more than a year since that was the case? Well, it's not, entire, it's not for lack of trying. You know, the, the, Both Moderna and Pfizer made beta and delta variant vaccines. And I'm going through this because it gets to why we are where we are in, in terms of what we know about the BA4 or 5 vaccine. So they generated, they went through sort of all of the steps you would want, preclinical data, dose finding in people, phase one for safety, phase two and phase three combined for immunogenicity. Um, and they were done, they worked pretty well. They showed better neutralization of these variant viruses. But in the end, they were not adopted because it was felt that the immune evasion of these variants wasn't enough. In other words, the wild type vaccine was working well enough that it wasn't worth getting new FDA approval, shifting manufacturing. For Omicron, it was clear that we needed something better, right? This devastated a lot of places in the world. Um, and we went through the same series of steps. And so from Thanksgiving Day that we heard about Omicron's existence till about May, it took about six months to get all of these data back. And they looked also good. There was robust safety data, um, promising immunogenicity data, much better for the BA1 boost than for the original wild type at neutralizing Omicron. But by then, Omicron was gone. Actually, BA2 was also gone. And we were starting to see BA2.12.1 and BA4.5 was on the rise. And so this data was presented to the FDA in roughly June. Um, and we already knew at that point that the BA1 boosts were not as good at BA, against BA4 or 5 as they were against BA1. So the FDA made a fairly um, aggressive, I think sort of somewhat uh, debatable or controversial, I should say, decision at the time, which is to say, we like these data, but we're not going to approve a BA1 vaccine. We want you to go back and actually make a BA4 or 5 vaccine. And we want you to make it for fall. So go ahead and start scaling up manufacturing. We know that you won't have enough time to get human immunogenicity, even immunogenicity data in people. We're, but we're going to consider this with only preclinical, meaning mouse data. And they're going to do this because they've seen series after series after series of variant boosters get a, get, generate good data, but come too late. And they said, we don't want to be behind again. BA4 or 5 looks pretty different than BA1. Let's just go straight to that. The UK made the opposite choice, and they've approved a BA1 vaccine. And I think actually either would have been a reasonable choice. I think this was the more aggressive move. It's just a concession that Omicron's moving faster than we're able to um, if we do all the bells and whistles that we would normally do outside of a pandemic. This is exactly, I should say, what's envisioned for the mRNA platform. We can make swaps or, uh, quickly. It's also similar to the logic that's used to approve flu shots, right? We don't require new phase three trials every winter when we have for every summer to approve flu shots for the fall. We just trust that we've seen enough 
data from flu shots that they are by and large safe, that small variations in the epitopes are not going to change that. And we just like try to match as best we can to the strains we think will be around. So that was the decision made here. The real caveat there is the mRNA platform is not quite as tried and true over the years. But boy, it's probably the most scrutinized single medical intervention that's ever been imposed on humanity at this point. It's billions of doses in. So I think that's a reasonable stance. Um, what do we know about the vaccine? So we know about safety essentially by inference from prior versions of prior vaccines. So mil billions of doses of the wild type, thousands of these prior um, variant vaccines, hundreds each. But we actually don't know a ton about the exact sequence that's out there in the pharmacies now. Similarly for efficacy, what we know is inferred from mouse immunogenicity. The fact that mouse immunogenicity has predicted human immunogenicity for every prior vi variant virus that's been tested and the wild type, and it predicted activity in the efficacy in the wild type. And then sort of immunological inference, which is just like things that look more like the things they're trying to prevent are probably going to work better. I'll show you the data for one. This is mouse data from Pfizer. Um, and these are mice that were given a primary vaccine series with a wild type and then a boost, a third dose, six months later with either the wild type shown here or a bivalent or a couple other options. And shown at the right of these curves is the BA4 is neutralization of the BA4 or 5 virus that's currently circulating. And you see that the bivalent vaccine neutralizes. This is a log scale, so about two and a half or three times better. So good, um, meaningfully good, I think. And for Moderna, they have similar data, but I'm actually showing you mouse efficacy data because it just dropped yesterday on BioArchive. And you see more than a log reduction in um, viral copies in the lung in a mouse um, that was immunized with this variant boost. So these, I will also say that these titers probably underestimate its benefit because they're checked like a week after the boost. And I would expect the durability of this uh, antibody to be better than that one because it's got a matched antigen to kind of keep it around and keep it riffing and improving. So it's kind of immunologically nerdy. If you don't get that, don't worry. But I actually think this is the minimum amount of benefit we'd expect to see um, antigenically. So. Um, we, there's still a lot we don't know about efficacy directly, but we can infer a lot. And on the basis of that, expert panels convened by the FDA and the CDC overwhelmingly approved these vaccines to be manufactured and rolled out. I got mine a week ago. I've talked to a few other folks who have as well. Um, and basically for the reasons I just told you, um, it makes immunological sense to me. I trust the platform after billions of doses um, and so much scrutiny. And there's lots of virus around and lots of room to improve on the, on the prior variants. And for me personally, I hadn't seen Omicron yet. But even if I had, I would wait a couple months. We'll get back to this in the Q&A. Um, and, and I would still go ahead with this vaccine. Um, for what it's worth, a little bit aches at about the 24 hour mark and I was back to normal the, the following day. So briefly, a word on kids. I know I'm running short on time, but um, the other thing that's happened since last we spoke is that the vaccine for the under five group has been approved. I'll say that my six and a half year old has, got, um, has been boosted now and my four year old has finished his primary series. And this is the data set that sort of mo I find most persuasive as to why I did that. Um, why I made that choice for my kids. Um, this is essentially exactly in line with the sort of things we vaccinate children for. It's rare outcomes are, bad outcomes are rare, but um, compared to in older people, but they're actually pretty, you know, they're as common as the other things we vaccinate for, and they're really random. They're hard to predict. Like I have healthy kids, but I can't say that mine wouldn't have been one of the rare few who had a bad outcome. Um, and so the number of total deaths caused by COVID per year in either the five to 11 or the six months to four years group is the same as the amount of deaths combined from these other five things that we routinely vaccinate against. Um, it's a top 10 cause of death in kids. That's not a common thing. Luckily, kids don't die in the US very often. But this is one of the things that kills them. We can basically take it off the list because vaccines work really well in kids. Again, not so well to prevent infection, although better than nothing, um, but uh, at least for a time, but really well, durably well against severe illness. And so this is a study from just a week ago, an observational study on nearly a million kids. Um, and I don't have time to go into the details, but you know, nearly, basically a point estimate of about 80% vaccine efficacy against hospital, hospitalization, seven deaths in the unvaccinated arm, and, or not arm, it's not randomized, but among the unvaccinated children and none among the vaccinated. Risks also look very low, especially in these youngest age groups. We now know that um, under 11, the risk of myocarditis in boys is barely above the baseline rate. And there are zero cases reported in girls under this age and zero cases reported in kids under five yet. Also zero cases reported from boosters yet, or at least not verified. So low risk, um, high benefit. If you've kids never seen COVID, for me, this is an easy call. And someone who's had COVID, I think it, the risk benefit is worth some more thought, but I, I would still vaccinate my kids if they were in this um, uh, uh, state. And then the sort of summary, I would say, is literally every single child of every physician I know in real life, not on Twitter, but in real life, has given their, ch their child every dose of the vaccine they're eligible for. And I know, I mean, this is like my job. I know a lot of docs, and this is true of every single one of their kids. 
um, for what that's worth. OK, you guys had some questions, and I'll try to answer them quickly. Um, how long to wait after infection to get a bivalent boost? Uh, the short answer is two to three months. There's some immunological magic. Your antibodies get a little bit better. They get a little bit refined over that time, and so you'll be boosting better antibodies. There's actually some data to support this now that earlier boosts are less effective than if you wait about two to three months. If you're high risk, I'd go on the shorter side of that. If you're normal risk, I'd go on the longer side of that. It's reasonable to adjust the timing if you like have a big trip, maybe get it a little early. You will get meaningful boost that then wanes over time. Um, there's an implicit question of why get it all, at all if you've already seen Omicron. And in my mind, I think we're just still early enough in our history with this virus that more looks at spike is better. Vaccines are a safe way to get them. So this is, in my mind, a really, I would absolutely do this for myself. I would tell my patients to do it. I'm telling you that this is, I think, a reasonable thing. Um, once you yourself are sort of personally comfortable with the safety. Okay, what do we know about intranasal vaccines? The hope is that they'll induce better mucosal immunity and thus prevent spread. I know essentially nothing in a data-driven way. I know that there are rumors that they've been approved in China, will be approved soon in India. But I've not seen the data that underlies that. So I can't say a lot for that, except that I am keeping an eye out. This could change trajectories in society. How well ventilated is the Broad facility? I'm pulling this from the FAQ page on the intranet, and the answer is better than most office spaces. Better in labs than in offices, but both have improved since the pandemic began. All of the recycled air is filtered before it's, uh, before it's delivered back to the building. And then if everyone in my household is as vaccinated as possible, how should we act now? This is a hard one for me to answer. It's gonna depend on circumstances. Some folks asked about me. Um, and I'll say I'm a little uncomfortable answering, and I'm also over time, but I'm happy to take that question in the Q&A. Just briefly, my kids are in school. They are not masking anymore. That's a change from the spring, and it's because my son finished his primary vaccine series. And then I'm still masking in sort of large public uh, settings. I had a mask when I was sitting there. I'm not to speak here. I'm, I'm relaxing slowly. Um, I'm not sure I've got this right, and I think we're all trying to figure this out as we go. So just sort of be kind and let folks do this at their own pace would be my advice. Um, so to summarize quickly, there's still a lot of virus around. Um, uh, this, uh, its impact on society is progressively decreasing because we're getting more immune. Um, it's mostly still Omicron, but there may be something else around the corner. We just don't see any evidence of it yet. Bivalent vaccines are available. You could get one today. Um, Global vaccine equity still matters. I can shout about it in all caps. We're not doing much about it. And that's just as true for bivalent vaccines as it ever was. And we're not really making any effort to roll them out. That makes me sad. Um, all kids greater than six months are eligible for a primary series. I've heard rumors bivalence may be available for five to 11 this fall and for under five by the winter, but we heard rumors like that last year and it took a while. Um, I expect another winter case surge. I hope to be wrong, but I hope it will also have less impact than last year. And I hope that we're all kind to each other as we try to figure this out. Sorry I went over time. Thanks for your attention.